Hey everyone, Jake here from CVP. Shooting super slow motion footage is always really fun. And today we are taking a look at a new camera that is trying to give that area of the market a good old shake up. This is the Freefly Ember. Freefly have been shipping the Embers for a few months now, but the camera is definitely still a work in progress. So things may have changed since we recorded this review. The Ember has been designed to do one thing very well, and that is shoot great looking high frame rate footage in the simplest way possible. Once you've got it rigged into a configuration you're happy with, it's incredibly easy and fast to use. The camera is so stripped back compared to other cameras on the market, which makes shooting with it very fast and simple. You can play back really nicely and smoothly on camera as well, or connect via the great app, which we'll talk about in a bit. During one of our shoots at the Loxford Joust, we recorded about three terabytes of cross the whole day on the Ember, equating to a roughly 25 hour long timeline. This could have been massively reduced if there was a pre-record feature, but as of the release of this camera, there currently isn't one, which is a bit of a shame. Comparing the footage which we shot with the Ember to the V-Raptor, you can see a clear difference in dynamic range between them, with the V-Raptor handling challenging lighting conditions much better. However, the Ember still can look fantastic, but highlights will clip a lot sooner than a comparably priced cinema camera, but that's the trade-off you've got to make for the insane frame rates that it can shoot. The sensor Freefly is using inside of the Ember is from G-Pixel, and from the specs, it looks like Freefly used the G-Sprint 4521. It is a Super 35 21 megapixel sensor with a max shooting resolution of 5120 by 4096 and a 5 by 4 native aspect ratio. It has a physical size of 23.04 by 18.43 millimeters, giving it a diagonal of 29.5 millimeters and a pixel pitch of 4.5 microns. It also uses a global shutter, which means that you will not run into any wrong shutter artifacts. As we said, the Ember has a maximum recording resolution of 5120 by 4096, and you can actually record up to 436 frames per second in this mode. This 5 by 4 aspect ratio may not be the most useful, but you have a massive range of options to choose from. As with most camera systems, as you lower your user resolution, you unlock higher frame rates. And that is also the case here with Ember 2. You can shoot 464 frames per second in a 4x3 mode, which will be great for anamorphic shooters. Just make sure that you have a monitor that can de-squeeze your given squeeze factor, as the camera doesn't have any de-squeeze function yet. You can do 616 in 16x9, 691 in a 2x1 aspect ratio, and 809 in a 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio. You can also crop into 4K. This will just lower your horizontal resolution changing your aspect ratio and lowering your data rate, but keeping your max frame rate possible the same. Your max frame rate will change as you switch between the different vertical resolutions. The maximum frame rate possible is 1011, which you can capture in both 5K 2.96 to 1 and 4K 2.37 to 1. The camera comes with an internal 4TB NVMe SSD pre-installed. When it comes to bitrate, the maximum the camera can capture is 2GB a second. 5120 by 2800 at 600 frames per second has a data rate of roughly 1.83 gigabytes per second, which means you will fill up the drive with a roughly 36 minute real time take. This stretched out to 24 frames per second would result in a 15 hour clip, which is pretty insane. Obviously, as you lower the resolution and frame rate, you will change your data rate. While I can't imagine too many people filling up the SSD and needing to offload it mid shoot, if you need to do this, it can take a while depending on what you're dumping your rushes onto. As of firmware 1.4.17, the Ember can now offload at roughly 300 to 350 megabytes a second. This is nowhere near the maximum of the 5 gigabits capable USB-C Gen 1 used on the Ember, so hopefully they will continue to improve this in future firmware. Due to the SSD being internal, when offloading from the camera it is unusable, which is a bit annoying, but hopefully with 4TB being so much storage, you won't have to do this while out on location or on set. One way to speed up the time spent offloading is to trim your clips before dumping them onto a second drive. This can be done in loads of NLEs or in quick time if you're on a Mac. Having to deal with really long clips is unfortunately part of the issue of having no pre-roll in the camera. You have to be rolling before you want to happen happens, which means clips are longer than necessary. I'm not sure whether the Ember has a cache built in which could potentially be unlocked, but if Freefly do open up the Ember and use the SSD internally for the pre-roll, that SSD will get rinsed through really quickly. 
I'm intrigued to see if this is something they address and how they do it. It could be an expansion of sorts, who knows. Currently the camera cannot record audio, but this may be possible in the future. I don't really think it's a massive deal breaker though, as most high frame rate footage will have sound designed for it. Color was one area that Freefly's last camera system, the Wave, really struggled in, as it was limited to just 8-bit. The Ember is now 10-bit, which means that the color is much better. Currently the camera only captures in ProRes 42 LT in all resolutions and frame rates, but Freefly is aiming to add support for 42 and 42 HQ when shooting at lower frame rates. At the moment you only have options to record in a 709 profile or a custom beta HLG profile. HLG beta is based on the hybrid log gamma transfer curve adapted to better fit this specific sensor. Freefly doesn't recommend using a standard HLG LUT with this profile. This profile boosts the shadows and flattens the highlights compared to Rec. 709, which helps preserve more dynamic range but may amplify shadow noise. This HLG profile is as log as Freefly are able to pull off currently with the hardware capabilities of the sensor and the frame rates of the camera while still keeping acceptable levels of noise. But I'm intrigued to see if this is something that they refine and update further down the line. Only the tone curve is adjusted when going between these two profiles. The color space is not transformed beyond white balance and will generally be undersaturated without further adjustment in post. So you definitely want to add a little pop of saturation and coloring in post to get the most out of the footage. The Ember doesn't feature an optical low pass filter and this means that footage is very detailed, but you can easily run into more with certain things in the frame. For example, on this bee's wing or our chart here. This is something you may be able to shoot around, just be conscious of it. We've been in talks with Kipatai about creating a low pass filter mount adapter that would help with this, but nothing is set in stone yet. Overall though, I am impressed with how detailed the footage is considering the frame rates that it shoots. It just looks great. Freefly has rated the native ISO of the Ember at 300, though you can't actually shoot at this, only 100, 200 and 400. The lower ISOs have less overall noise, but if you are struggling for light, which happens a lot with frame rates this high, shooting 400 is the way to go. There is currently no black shade function possible which is a shame, as the camera does have a little bit of noise in the shadows that can creep into the mids. The noise that is present in some of the darker shots can be cleared up fairly well by adding some noise reduction in post though. For these examples we just use Resolve's built in one, but you could get better results from something like Topaz. It does look to have a bit of fixed pattern noise as well, but this again is easily removed with noise reduction as well. For our latitude test, we wanted to show how the Ember compared to a cinema camera around the same price as it, so we grabbed a Red V Raptor VV8K. This was a harder test to shoot for us thanks to Ember's limited gamma options, but here is a rough breakdown of our methodology that we used for it. Looking at the footage, it's immediately apparent the massive difference in image quality between the two cameras. Looking at overexposure, we can see that the Ember falls apart very quickly compared to the Raptor. Sam's skin clips at just two stops over on the Ember, whereas the Raptor doesn't clip on his skin until four stops. At four stops on the Ember, the chart looks pretty rough, with loads of clipping, whereas the Raptor still looks great. The Raptor also holds on to a lot more shadow detail. The Ember does look alright at two or three stops under, whereas the Raptor is still pretty salvageable down to five stops. I think the big takeaway from this is that you need to make sure you expose the Ember to what you are shooting. This will always be a balance of highlight and shadow detail, and different shots will need to be exposed differently. Just bear in mind that you don't have anywhere near as much headroom as you would when exposing a more traditional cinema camera. Freefly's first attempt at a high-speed camera was the Wave back in 2020, and it offered a lot of frame rates at its price point, but it wasn't perfect. The big drawback was the sensor that they used for it had serious limitations when it came to dynamic range and colour. It could produce good images in controlled studio environments, but in situations with more uncontrollable varied lighting, the Wave's limited dynamic range could result in some pretty harsh looking highlights. The Ember's image quality is a big improvement over the Wave, and so is the form factor and body design as a whole. The Ember is a clear step in the right direction for Freefly, and it's great to see. The Ember is a really nice compact size, considering what it can do. I love the olive green colour that they chose to finish these early units in. They are using Cerakote here, which is a ceramic based coating that feels very nice to the touch. However, this colourway will only be available for the first few hundred units and after that, they'll be changing the finish to an anodized grey one. It's a very light camera, weighing just 852 grams, completely stripped down with just the e-mount. 
This means that it should be relatively easy to get onto light support equipment and even drones, which I think was a massive thing that Freefly were thinking about when designing this camera. The camera is IP52 rated, which means it can handle light rain, but it's not waterproof. Perfect for a glorious English autumn afternoon. On the top of the camera, you have a range of mounting points, so you can get a monitor on, which is pretty essential. And then you have your witness mark alongside other markings for your inputs and outputs, which we'll look at in a minute. On the bottom of the camera, there are four M3 threads and then two quarter 20 threads and two locating pins. This is a nice set of options and means that most accessories should mount securely with no risk of spinning. On the front, you have a 3.5 mm mic in as well as a headphone out. And you then have four M3 screws positioned around the edge of the body and then the removable E-mount. This E-mount doesn't have any electronics, so it's purely there for adapting as any lenses that need power will not work with this, which is pretty much every Sony first party E-mount lens. This mount is easily removable and replaceable with third party one, such as one from the likes of Kipatai. Kipatai's adapters are fantastic, and luckily they have made three different ones for the Ember. You have two solid PL mounts, one of which is regular and the other is a lightweight version. And then you also have their PL revolver, which will allow you to use any of the regular revolver cartridges with this system. We found the E-mount to be a bit picky with what E-mount adapters it likes to be used with it. So I think for the most part, it's definitely worth grabbing some kind of hard mount replacement like these ones from Kipatai. On the right, you have a bunch going on. First off, you have a connector that will be used for upcoming accessories, which will connect directly to the camera using these pins. Above and below that, you have a witness mark and then a pair of M3 screws, which are used for mounting accessories. You then have a nice large exhaust grill for their fans to push air through. You then have another pair of M3 threads and then your main control buttons. The top button is the select button, Next is the record button, and lastly you have the on-off switch. When in standby mode, the select and record buttons will flash green, and when recording, they will all go red. On the top corner of the camera, you have a really nice dial, which is how you control the camera's very basic menu system. This feels really nice, and does make navigating the functions really smooth and easy to do. On the left, you have the same array of four M3 threads, and the same decent sized grill for air intake. On the back you have a huge array of cooling fins, which you really need to keep clear so they can do their job, as this camera can get quite toasty. Amongst them you have an expansion port that Freefly have touted to be incredibly fast, but at the moment not enabled. You then have a range of inputs and outputs, with the first being a 4-pin Modex cable connector. The camera comes with a nice short D-tap cable for powering it, but you can pick up spares of these from Freefly, which I think is probably worth doing. The camera can draw up to 55 watts when shooting in 5K at the max frame rate, and from there will range down to about 30 watts when in standby. This means that with some nice compact V-mount batteries, you'll be able to power the camera for a good while. Next is a Gig E Ethernet port that has been included for the future development of camera control and the offloading of footage over a network, which will be a great addition. Next is a full-size HDMI port capable of outputting 1080p 30. Of course, everyone would have preferred an SDI here and I think Freefly are fully aware of this. Next is a Type-C USB 3.2 port, which can be used for dumping your rushes off of the internal SSD. And lastly, you have a six pin serial GH port, which is the same GPIO port as on the Wave. Freefly currently has a cable for Movi Pro start stop, but are also looking at expanding control for Movi Pro to offer playback and other camera settings. They are hoping for a wireless controller trigger, but right now they do have instructions for how to use the cable they offer to build a simple remote trigger for the camera. The menu system of the Ember is pretty stripped back currently, but this does make shooting with it very simple. You can control the camera via the buttons on the side and the dial on the top. This allows you to quickly dart between the different settings. Let's work from left to right. First is the mode. Here you can switch between standby and playback mode. When in playback mode, it's decently smooth to scrub and play back through, but the app may be a better place to do this, which we'll look at in a minute. You can then define your shooting width and height along with your frame rate. With the frame rate, you can really dial this in or you can just hit max FPS to shoot the max FPS in a given resolution, which is really helpful. You can then dial in the shutter angle and gain and then choose from the two current color profiles available. Next is color temperature and tint. There is no auto white balance currently, so you need to set this manually. You can then set your project frame rate, which is a pretty new addition to the camera and a very helpful one at that. You can control the fan here too. It can be set to low, normal or high. Low will keep the fans off for short clips or in standby mode 
and high can be used to force the fans to maximum speed whenever recording is in progress. Regardless of the setting, the fans will turn on and adjust their speed when necessary to maintain the system performance. Next, you can change the time and then format the camera. Lastly, you have a mix of settings that relate to the Wi-Fi. You can toggle it on or off, change channels and check IP details. The Ember has seen plenty of firmware updates already, but there are still a few things missing that I would love to see. With how active Freefly has been with their updates for this, I'm sure we'll see more features and changes coming in the future. The Ember's app is still currently in beta, but it's actually really nicely put together. It's very fast and easy to change camera settings, and you can even play back clips here really smoothly, trim them, and then export them out in a range of formats and settings. This is awesome and will make sharing clips with people a very easy and fast process. If you're thinking about grabbing or renting an Ember, it's definitely worth getting access to the app, the link to which I've put in the description below. When it comes to accessories, Freefly offer a good range of options. I'm sure there will be more third party options hitting the market more and more. You have a good range of rigging available so you can build the camera up exactly as you need to. It's mainly NATO based, which makes it really easy to rig and de-rig as you need to. I would say some of the key accessories would be the rear cheese plate, a battery plate to mount onto it, a few NATO rails for the sides and top of the camera, and then a side handle or two. So what can we say about the Ember that we haven't already? It produces great high frame rate imagery, and it is so easy to shoot with thanks to the stripped back design and excellent form factor. It's a camera that you just want to carry around with you everywhere to capture something that you may think looks cool at these crazy frame rates that it can shoot. Is it going to replace all of the Phantoms out there? No, they still have their place, but it's definitely a massive step towards really disrupting that market, which doesn't happen very often. Its price point is incredibly aggressive given what it can do. And for people renting in Phantoms a lot, you could benefit from just buying one of these and hiring it out with yourself when you don't need the extra features, frame rates, or image quality that a Phantom can capture. I really hope FreeFly keep pushing the development of the Ember, and their slow motion cameras as a whole, as they really have hit a nice sweet spot with the Ember. Anyway, let us know what you think of the FreeFly Ember, or if you have any other questions in the comments below. And if you like the video, please give it a like, and maybe consider subscribing so you don't miss out on our awesome upcoming content. And thank you so much for watching.